morning. Welcome to worship here at uh, Mayfair United Church. My name is Michael Webster. I'm filling in for Reverend Shelley while she gets a well-deserved break. I'll be here next Sunday as well. Um, this is a Sunday in which the rest of the country got an extra hours of sleep. And I don't care. <laughs> I don't want an extra hour of dark in the morning. I like the getting up in the morning. So happy with that. I had a great summer. I hope you guys had a great summer. Um, you did good. Lots of people did good. Uh, and, and finally, just let me say what a treat it is to have people here. I'm so happy to see real people instead of just talking to a camera. What a delight. Although I have to say, it did mean that I had to polish my shoes yesterday. When you're just talking to a camera, you don't really worry about how dirty your shoes are. So I had to clean up my shoes. But anyway, that's, that's all right. Let's, uh, let's bring ourselves into a, a time of worship. Now our, with our call to worship. Today we remember. We remember courage and sacrifice. We remember fear and suffering. We remember freedom and those who have preserved it. We remember the terrible cost of freedom. We remember lest we forget. And now, although we know there are places of darkness in the world, we also know that this light shines this light of Christ shines in the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. Thanks be to God. At this time, we also uh, acknowledge the territory on which we are worshiping, and we give thanks for those who have lived on this land for generations innumerable. We also acknowledge that uh, we are all treaty people, bound by the understandings made in the agreement known as Treaty 6. Again, we give thanks. Please join me now in our prayer of approach and confession. Words will be on the screen. I, I'm not sure that anybody at home is listening. We've had a, a glitch. YouTube feed is not showing anything. Anyway, together we can join together uh, in these words. O oh God, at this annual time of remembrance, come gently into our worship this morning that we may know your peace. When we reflect on the things that make for war and the things that make for peace, we know we have too often preferred violence or indifference over the hard work of making peace through just solutions and reconciliation. Forgive us, we pray, and give us courage to seek peace. This we pray in the name of the Prince of Peace. Amen. When my, uh, my granddaughter was a little bit younger, we used to play Jenga, Jenga with her. You know, we would build a tower, and then it would all fall down. And she would say, try again, try again. And that's, that's the good news of the gospel, that uh, by God's grace, we are forgiven, we are accepted, and we are free to try again, try again, to live better lives, to live lives of, of faithfulness and service to our neighbors. And for this, we give thanks to God. Our opening hymn is God of Grace and God of Glory.
Oh, life and work of the church. I don't think I ever downloaded those announcements, GN. Yeah. Um, what's going on in the church? <laughs> what do people need to know about? Sign up for ushering. Thank you. Yes. Yep. Please sign up for ushering. We need ushers. Yeah. You guys know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. You know what's going on. Office is closed on Thursday for Remembrance Day. Yeah. Good. Uh, and now a time of celebrations and concerns. I don't know. I have a basket of stuff. Thank you. Is this just celebra are celebrations in here as well? Okay. So we will. I will list. Uh, I'll mention first that uh, Marlene is uh, not feeling well with shingles. That's very unpleasant. Yeah. Here's a note. Uh, neighbor lost uh, lost his job and is deeply depressed. Needs our prayers. And has. What's this list here? Sue Sawatsky has been home for four days and is starting to walk. Did she have a knee surgery or anything else? Fell and broke her hip. Oh my goodness. Ah. I'm sorry to hear all of that. That's all I'm seeing here. But we do hold those people on our in our prayers. Are there any celebrations you want to just shout out at me? Anybody happy about anything? Yes. Good for you. We're proud of you. Way to go. That's hard work. Well done. Anything else? Okay. I know you're happy about stuff, but you just think maybe it's not, ha you know, enough to, to announce. Yes, Philip. Jerusalem artichokes for the taking. And you just have to put up with the consequences. All right. Thank you for that. Now let's take a moment to, uh, to share the peace of Christ. And we don't do that the way we used to do it, of course. But uh, if you want to wave at people or give them a, a sign of, uh, of your good wishes for them and, and uh, that you wish the peace of Christ to be with them, please do so. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Now a, a time with the children, a chance to uh, talk with our young ones. Um, we'll have to watch it on the recording, I think. But uh, this is uh, Remembrance Sunday. Uh, and of course, we're, this is the Sunday closest to Remembrance Day, which is Thursday. And I know that young people are going to hear about that at school and, and, and I hope at home as well. Um, but just thinking about Remembrance Day has got me thinking about remembering. And I don't remember as well as I used to. I have trouble remembering names now. Uh, I have just, I find myself, I go down to the basement to get something, and I can't remember what it was when I get there. And so I have to go back upstairs and stand in the place where I was when I decided to go downstairs and get it. And then I remember what it was. And I can go down, and this time I usually remember uh, what it is. Maybe some of uh, the rest of you know what that's like. So remembering gets you know harder and harder. Uh, but there's there's things you can do, you know, about to help you remember. 
uh, you know, you can make uh, a list. You know, when you go to the store, you make a list so you remember to get everything. Uh, usually, and uh, sometimes if I have to do something, I'll make myself a note. Like if I have to do something first thing in the morning, I'll make a note and put it on the kitchen table before I go to bed. But just the act of making the note helps. Re I, don't, I don't actually have to see that note in the morning. It could be just having made the note helps me remember first thing in the morning. And of course, I got my phone, so I can put reminders on my phone, and I can set an alarm. If I have to make a call or something at a certain time, I can set an alarm for five minutes before. And there's lots of ways that I can I can help to be re to remember. But an old-fashioned way of remembering, and what I was taught when I was a child, was to tie a string around your finger. Uh, and so uh, I got I brought some string with me. Some of you old people will recognize what this is. This used to be in every uh, butcher shop and grocery store, a big roll of twine like that. I got, I got that when we were first married. It's, that's almost 50 years old. Anyway, I'm going to tie a string around my finger to remind me of something. Left over right. And wrong. I got, that, I got that part. I just have to make the bow now. Go like that. I don't think this is going to work. I need some help. Gina, can you give me a hand? I can't tie a bow with one hand. <laughs> <laughs> Piece of string here. Good. That's it. Thank you. And really, the thing about tying a string around your finger, I think it's because you can't do it. I think it's because you need to get some help to do it. And that's the best way of all to remember, is to remember with someone to uh, be a little help when you need it. Remember that, kids. Now I can remember to do something. <laughs> Our scripture readings for this morning. Today's scripture reading is from Ruth, chapters 3, verse 1 through 5, and chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you, so that it may be well with you. Now here is our kinsman, Boaz, with whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself, put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do, she said to her. All that you tell me, I will do. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. Reading from Mark, chapter 12, verses 38 through 30, 44. As Jesus taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive greater condemnation. 
He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury, many rich people in large sums. A poor widow came up and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the treasury, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty, and has put in everything she had, all that she had to live on. Thank you. I don't I remember his name, but thank you. And our hymn is Spirit, Open My Heart. You know, the deeper I get into retirement and the fewer opportunities I have to stand in front of a group of people like you that I care about and, and share our, what I think about our faith and what it is to be a follower of Jesus, the, the more I want to just concentrate on what I think is really important. And one of the things I think is most important is this idea of grace. And my dictionary says that grace means an unmerited favor. In other words, a gift. That's what grace is. You know, when you see an athlete, or uh, maybe you watch Dancing with the Stars, or in my YouTube feed I get old black and white clips of Fred Astaire, and, uh, you know, you, you see somebody like that, and you think, oh, they're so graceful. What you're really saying is they have a gift. Because to be graceful is a gift. God's grace is a gift. It's not something we have earned. It's not something we deserve. It's not something we've worked for. It's not a, a reward for, for a long service, you know, like a kind of a spiritual version of a gold watch. It's just a gift. And the appropriate response to receiving a gift is to be grateful, right? It's no coincidence that, that the words graceful and grateful come from the same Latin root because they're so connected. 
I was driving somewhere a while ago, and I heard Paul Simon singing Graceland. Graceland. It's a, it's a song about, uh, about him shortly after his divorce, driving with his son to go to Elvis Presley's mansion, which, of course, is called Graceland. Now, I don't care about where Elvis used to live, but I was struck by the song's concluding line. I have reason to believe we all will be received in Graceland. I have reason to believe we all will be received in Graceland. See, Graceland to me isn't just where Elvis used to live. It's where we live. It's faithland. It's the unmerited gift of God to us all. It's the spirit of God in our midst. I find Paul Simon's words to be as complete and powerful a statement of faith as any creed. I have reason to believe we all will be received in Graceland. Now, I could easily talk about the, the gift of the poor woman in Mark's story who put a few pennies on the offering plate, and Jesus points out how large her gift is because she had so little from which to give. And how appropriate that would be on Remembrance Sunday, Sunday to honor this woman who gave her all. Still, I cannot resist this wonderful story from Ruth, also about a gift. Now, we've heard the, the end of the story in today's reading. Last week, you heard the beginning of it, but let me just remind you a little bit about it. A young woman named Naomi gets married, and she and her husband have two sons. They're a farm family, but there's a drought. And they lose the farm, and, and they're forced, actually, to, to leave their country and go off to a foreign land, off to Moab. They're refugees in that place. But, you know, like a lot of refugees, they settle in. The two boys grow up, and they get married, marry local girls. But then the husband dies. And then the two sons die. And suddenly, it's just Naomi and her two daughters-in-law named Orpah and Ruth. You probably know the story uh, that uh, of a young African American woman who was supposed to be named Orpah, uh, but there was a mix-up on her on the birth certificate, and she ended up being called Oprah instead. You probably heard of her, yeah. Anyway, the names of the men in this story don't matter, but the names of the women do. Isn't that a delightful switch from a lot of our Bible stories? Naomi decides to go back home, back to Israel. And Ruth, in deciding to go with her, makes one of the most memorable speeches in all the Bible. She says to her, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. What a wonderful expression of love and loyalty. And that's the gift that Naomi, that Ruth gives to Naomi, this gift of love and loyalty. We're in this together, she says, whatever the future may hold for us. And that, my friends, that's Graceland. No matter where on the planet these two end up or whatever happens to them, the spiritual geography they're going to live in is Graceland. Now, it's not easy for them. They are two widows with no visible means of support. They live on the spilled grains of barley that Ruth picks up in the field one at a time after the harvesters have gone through. She and the other impoverished women who do this work are called gleaners. And of course, it's not sustainable. You can't do that year round. But Ruth, who is apparently an attractive young woman, has attracted the attention of Boaz, the farmer in whose fields she has been gleaning. Naomi realizes that Boaz is a distant relative of her dead husband, and perhaps because of that he might feel some, some responsibility for these two widows. Well, once Naomi and Ruth have set their sights on Boaz, he doesn't stand a chance. 
roof gets all cleaned up and dolled up and perfumed up. And Naomi tells her what to do. She says, go to the threshing floor where Boaz is supervising the harvest, his own harvest. Wait till he's had his fill of food and drink and then and has laid down for the night. And then go and lift his blanket and lay at his feet and he'll tell you what to do next. So there it is. Biblical advice on how to get what you want from a man. It's important. It is right. First, you wait until he's been fed and watered, or wined and dined, whatever. And then if it's something really important, before you ask, you might want to crawl under a blanket with him. That's the biblical advice. Now, I think it's reasonable to wonder what happened on the threshing floor that night. The Bible is ambiguous about that, and deliberately so, I think. If you want to believe that Ruth acted as a kind of a human hot water bottle to keep Boaz's feet warm all night, that's what the Bible says happened. On the other hand, it's also true that in these ancient texts, to uncover someone's feet was a way of saying something else without actually saying it. You think, well, why would they do that? You know, we do that all the time. You know, if you go to a restaurant, you know, when we get to go to restaurants again, in the back of the restaurant, there'll be a doorway, and above it will be a sign that says restrooms. A restroom is not actually a place where if you're feeling a little tired, you go and have a rest. Or if someone says to you, uh, I'm going to the bathroom, nobody thinks they're going to have a bath. Or even you might say, uh, I'm, I'm using the washroom. Well, I hope you wash your hands afterwards. But that's really not why you're going there. It's just a lot of restroom, washroom, bathroom, facilities. It's a lot of way of avoiding saying toilet room. So we do that kind of thing too. We say one thing, so we, but we mean something else. Sometimes in the Bible, most of the times in the Bible, feet just means feet. Sometimes it means other body parts. On the other hand, now I've run out of hands. This is my third hand. On the third hand, in ancient Hebrew, the, the word translated here as blanket also means wing. So when Ruth says, throw your blanket over me, she might be saying something like, take me under your wing. That's what's going on. No matter what happened or didn't happen on the threshing floor that night, and it's really none of our business, in the morning, the first thing that Boaz said to himself when he woke up was, I have to marry this woman. And so he did. And in the terms of the story, this too was a gift. And as far as we know, they lived happily ever after in Graceland. Now the reason this story is in the Bible, aside from the fact that it's just a rip-roaring good story, is found in the last verses we heard this morning. Ruth, a foreigner, is the great-grandmother of David, King David. Yes, it's true. The ancestry of David, the great hero of Israel, is not pure. You know, if David had lived in the American South 100 years ago, if his great-grandmother had been black, then he would legally have been black. He would have had to drink from that fountain set aside for the colored folks, you know. But in the Bible, what mattered is not David's ancestry, but as Martin Luther King said, the content of his character. What mattered was the gift of Ruth's love and loyalty. Now for me, the acceptance of, of Ruth and of David, David, despite his ethnic impurity, gives us reason to believe we all will be received in Graceland. There's another story about grace I'd like to tell you. So about a young man named Gordon Arthur Kelly, used his middle name, Arthur Kelly who died a few years ago at the ripe old age of 97. Gordon Kelly, or Arthur Kelly, was uh, born in Moose Jaw, 
was going to say Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, but really, <laughs> how many Moose Jaws are there? He was born in Moose Jaw, but he didn't stay there for very long. His mother was uh, unmarried at a time when that was a scandal, and so she gave him up for adoption. And before long, his adoptive family moved to California. Now, Arthur Kelly's adopted family treated him very well. He says in retrospect, but at the time when he was a kid, he thought they were pretty strict and, uh, and they gave him a lot of chores to do. So when he was a teenager, he ran away from home. This is in the 1930s. So like a lot of young men in those days, he spent some time riding the rails. He got a first-hand look at poverty. He saw families in the woods living in, in huts made out of pieces of bark. He visited the hobo camps got chased by the railroad guards, the whole bit. Eventually, Arthur Kelly settled down. And, <clears throat> and he went on to have a very successful career in show business. He hosted a, a popular television show for 25 years. He appeared in movies. He wrote best-selling books. He was a household name. Everybody knew this fellow. but he never forgot those days riding the rails. Now, wait a minute, you're thinking, I never heard of Gordon Arthur Kelly. He can't have been that famous. Well, that's because that was his birth name. In show business, he used his adopted name, which was Art Linkletter. Now, it's been a while since Art Linkletter was on TV, so there may be some folks who, who still don't recognize that name. He's most famous for a, a segment that he did called Kids Say the Darndest Things. Everybody, yeah, you remember that. Uh, on live TV, he would interview, interview children, and he had a real knack for getting these kids to open up and say something that was adorable or hilarious or outrageous. Uh, very popular segment. And, and as someone who occasionally interacts with children live, uh, I, can, I can vouch for the fact that kids do sometimes say the darndest things. They really do. In his later years, <clears throat> Art Linkletter was asked what he remembered about those early years riding the rails. He spoke about poverty and how you really don't know what it is unless you've lived it. He spoke about how people helped each other. Uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but, but he said that it was the worst, of, uh, worst that could happen to people, but it often brought out the best in us. If he had to choose one memory, he said, it would be the man who shared a sandwich with him. Art was hungry, and he came across another hungry man who had a sandwich, and without a word spoken between him, the man handed Art half of his sandwich. Looking back on it decades later, Linkletter was still amazed. He didn't even hesitate, he said. He didn't even hesitate. See, that's Graceland. Now, I mean, let me be clear about that. Graceland is not a place. Graceland exists wherever unmerited favor shows itself. Graceland exists wherever and whenever gifts are freely given with no expectation of return. Graceland is God's gift of the life and teachings and death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Graceland comes into being in the ministry of his congregation. Graceland comes into being in the generosity we show to friends and to strangers in our daily lives. The giving of a smile or a word of encouragement a show of support that means so little to those who give it and means so much to those who receive it. I hope you will join me, not just in seeking to live in Graceland, but also in inviting others to join us there. For I have reason to believe we all will be received in Graceland. Thanks for your time. What are we doing next here? We join our hearts and minds in prayer. <clears throat> God of skies so blue and clouds so white, 
of the bright blessed day in the dark sacred night. We think to ourselves, what a wonderful world. We give thanks on this day for the glories of this autumn season, for cool mornings and sunny afternoons, for leaves that skitter across our path and scrunch beneath our feet. Winter is coming on some tomorrow, but we bless you for today. We give thanks for the raucous chatter of a cedar bush full of sparrows, for snowshoe hares standing upright to eye us warily, for magpies chasing each other through the treetops. We give thanks for friends, family members, who share with us their love and their laughter. What a wonderful world you have made. We give thanks for the freedoms we enjoy and for those whose sacrifices made them possible. We remember the lives that were lost and the scars, both visible and invisible, that were being born and still are. We pray for peace. We pray never again. We also pray for those who are sick and for those who are grieving, for those whose businesses have closed and those whose jobs have disappeared. We pray for those who are lonely and isolated, for those who are quarantined, for those who are just tired of the whole thing. We pray for courage and resilience and for that peace of mind and heart that is your presence in our lives. Be with our healthcare workers, essential workers, and laboratory researchers. Bless them in their work and grant them strength to carry on. We pray for our friends and other nations as they struggle. And we pray for ourselves as well, that our leaders at every level may govern with wisdom, compassion, and understanding. These prayers, as well as the secret longings of our hearts, we bring before you in prayer and we continue in the prayer with the words that Jesus taught, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is May the God of Hope Go With Us. But as we go from this place, friends, let us remember, let us remember that uh, the God of hope does go with us. That we are called to be beacons of hope for others as well in our lives. Go now in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the companionship of the Holy Spirit go with each one of you this day and evermore. Amen. Amen.